So as always, I want to start by saying thank you everyone for joining. My name is Cody Armstrong, and today we're discussing what's new in Onshape. And if you haven't attended one of these webinars in the past, in these webinars we take a look at the past month and the updates that, that were in that month and go into them in a little bit more detail than we typically do, you know, kind of in our what's new uh, video series. Um, another thing I always like to stress with our webinars is these really uh, are an opportunity for you to get your questions answered. So please ask any questions that you'd like. There's a questions section in the GoToWebinar control panel. Feel free to ask any question you'd like, and I'll do my best to, to stop and answer these. This is going to be a short webinar. We have two updates in the month of September uh, to discuss, and we will be uh, going over those in, in greater detail. If anyone has any kind of issues with audio or video, please let me know. And I think we'll dive right into things. So first, before we get into the specifics of this update, these updates in September, I want to give you a brief history on the update process in Onshape. First off, the key thing to keep up in mind with Onshape is it's updated every three weeks. So in September, we actually had two updates that we're going to discuss here today. So roughly every three weeks, we get a new update. Um, the updates are automatic and transparent. What I mean by that is they're done by us. We manage the updates, and they're totally transparent to you. You sign in, and you design, and that's all you really have to think about. The updates of uh, the Onshape product and the, the actual models themselves are all managed by us internally. This has a number of different advantages. Of course, it means you don't have to focus on downloads, installs, updates, updating of files, uh, making sure everyone's on the same version of a CAD package. That's something that's historically been an issue. Uh, so this eliminates all of that. Everyone using Onshape is always on the latest version. Uh, of course, these updates include new functionality, and that's what we're talking about here today. So we're going to go over the new features that were inclu included in the month of September. But keep in mind, you know, these are going to be happening often. If you're new to Onshape and the update process, uh, you're going to see new features being added roughly every three weeks or so. So let's dig into it. Now, the agenda today is pretty straightforward. We're going to take a look at the recent updates. Uh, there were two updates in September, on September 7th and September 28th. And we're going to go through a few of the key improvements in each of those updates. Now, as I mentioned, feel free to ask any questions that you like. There's that question section in the Go to Webinar control panel. Feel free to ask any question you'd like, and I'll do my best to stop and, and answer all the questions before we wrap things up here today. All right, so before we get into the specific updates, I want to take just a moment to discuss things we've done over the past nine months. And there's literally been hundreds of improvements added in, in the past nine you know, plus months or so now uh, of 2018. Some of the bigger improvements that I want to mention, though, if you're new to Onshape, uh, release management. That was added in late March. Uh, same goes for simultaneous bill of materials. Configurations added very early on in 2018 in January. Um, standard content, same thing, added very early on. All these things have been improved over the you know uh, releases that have come after them, but they were all added this year, right? Also, Onshape Enterprise, an entirely new product for us, was added uh, this year as well. Now there are many, many drawing improvements uh, throughout. 2018. So there's far too many to list uh, here or any you know single slide. So just again to keep in mind, you know we have had you know in the past nine months or so quite a few big you know announcements, right? Release management, simultaneous bill of materials. These are big pieces of functionality that we were adding. All right, so let's jump into it again. Just to stress, please ask any questions that you'd like. Now. I want to start with the September 7th update. Uh, September 7th update had, in fact, both of these updates had a big focus on drawings. And you're going to see a number of improvements around drawings. So the first one is entirely new grip point types 
and on shape drawings. And that's a particularly useful one. It's a, a, as many of these are, a quality of life improvement in terms of drawings. Right? So um, if you need to move something around, you'll now see a circular grip point indicating that. Right? Whereas if you need to resize something, you'll see a square grip point indicating this is where you click to resize. And it's just meant to give you better feedback at the drawings level about whether you're moving or resizing. I'm going to go over an example of this um, with the table drag behavior in, in just a bit. But important to keep in mind the grip point types, whether it's dimensions or annotations, anything that you're dragging essentially, you'll now have new grip point options. The big ones that I would stress, uh, closed circles are where you'd grab to move. And squares are where you grab to resize something, right? You'll also have hollow circles. Hollow circles, for instance, if you wanted to rotate a note, you'd see a hollow circle option to rotate a note. Um, and then a diamond uh, uh, feedback, a diamond grip point will flip, right? So um, again, I'm going to go over an example of some of these in just a bit, so, so bear with me. But one very small but big quality of life improvement. Right? It's a small thing in terms of the interface, but definitely something that's welcome to those doing a lot of drawings. The next one I want to mention is automatically create a version when importing. So this is something that comes up quite often. When you import geometry into a document, and then you want to take that geometry and insert that into another document, uh, there was always this step in the background that you had to create a version. Right. You had to go to the original whenever it was imported and create a version in that document before that could be inserted into anything else. Right? And so what we've done in this update is automatically do that for you. So as a part of the import process, when you do an import, a version will be created. And this means that you, the biggest um, plus here is that you just don't have to do it manually. Right. Um, you can imagine if I import everything into multiple documents, for instance, and I have dozens of documents potentially, um, creating a manually creating a version in each one just so that I can insert that into another document is is a tedious task. And so that's where this really makes a lot of sense. Um, I do have a you know, admittedly rather simple example uh, that I can take you through. Um, so bear with me for a moment here. Let's go ahead and import. We'll just grab a zip file, right? And we will import that. There really isn't a whole lot to show here. The import process is basically the same. What differs, of course, is what happens immediately after the import is finished. So once you've imported, right, it imports, it does its usual translation. In this case, this is a CAD model, so it's translating the model as well. Uh, but then once those things are done, you a, a version will be created in the document, right? So uh, if we go to created by me, let's jump into this come along dot zip, right? What you'll see after everything is done again is a version is created, right? So you can see V1 here. The reason this is so important again is just because if I wanted to insert any piece of this assembly into another assembly in a different document, I'd have to do this anyway. Um, and it would be a manual step that it would have to do. So now it's just a default part of the import process. Right? So again, to stress that, um, just jumping back here, automatically creating a version after an import. All right, so the next one, uh, you'll see on the screenshot on the left there, additional uh, balloon shapes. So in the past, we had limited balloon shapes. Right? You had circle, diamond. Um, and double circle, I believe. But now we have a number of different balloon shapes as options when you're creating your callouts. Um, it's there's not a, a whole lot to show besides the fact there's just additional uh, options, right? So uh, if I were to, this may not be the most relevant. Let's go into an example like this one, for instance. If I were to go into callout, right? What you would see is under this dropdown, many more balloon shapes. Right. In the past, this was just a handful. I believe it was just circle diamond and double circle, but I could be um, I could be wrong about that. But I know many of these were not here in the past. Hexagon, octagon, rectangle, those types um, were not there in the past. So 
it, again, very simple thing, of course, but now if you're looking to define you know, your callouts with a hexagon, uh, you can do that. Right? So that is additional balloon shapes. The, the key thing there to keep an eye on is just in the callout command under the dropdown for shape, there are additional shapes there. All right, so let's move on to the next one. Autocomplete for feature script local variables. Now, obviously, this is for feature script users, but if you're uh, using feature script day in, day out, this is going to be a big one for you. And I'm just going to briefly show you this one, so bear with me for a moment here. I'm going to create a new feature studio, and let's just say I want to create um, you know, our pocket fillet example. So I'm going to insert some of these, you know, templates for features and so on. Let's call this the pocket fillet. And let's say I want the user to click on a face. So we'll insert a query parameter here. Uh, face, that's good. And then I want to create a variable and define it by whatever, you know, the user, whatever face the user clicks on. So let's say var selected face equals definition dot my query All right so essentially i'm saying here whatever the user clicked on define that as the variable selected face now in the past these variables these local variables that you defined yourself did not uh, automatically complete when you went to use them in other places so for instance let's say that i wanted to you know select all the concave faces of whatever you know the user clicks on oh, i could create a variable saying uh, var concave faces equals query concave connected faces and what i want to say is grab all the concave connected faces to whatever the user clicked on which is variable selected face so <clears throat> forgive me in the past you had to get the syntax just right i had to type the variable name very specifically or copy and paste but now if I start to type selected, you'll see the local variable has an autocomplete option, which means I have all the autocomplete you know, functionality that I would have as if this were variable, you know, were part of the Onshape library. In the past, that only worked if it was you know, part of Onshape's library of features. Right? So again, the autocomplete for local variables when defining feature script, it's a small thing. But it, you know, there's a lot of simple errors that can come from typos and variable names, and so it led to a lot of copy and pasting, or you know, just you know, having to be a stickler about the names and and uh, you know, typing them out. So again, a small usability improvement, but quality of life definitely a, a big improvement for those doing a lot of feature script. All right, so the next improvement to discuss is big if you do a combination of two things. You do a lot of mobile work, right? You do a lot of on shape on a mobile device and you happen to work with sheet metal. The last caveat I would add to that is you're also an iOS user. As of today, this improvement is specific to iOS. But as of this update, as of the September 7th update, you can now create sheet metal parts from your mobile device, right? From your iOS device, I should clarify that. Um, this will be coming, of course, to Android. So this is not, this is just temporarily only specific to iOS. Um, but you can now create sheet metal parts on iOS devices. Um, if this will cooperate here, bear with me for just a second. I would like to show you this. All right, so there's really not uh, a ton to show besides new sheet metal options. So in, in this case, this is an iPad. On my iPad, the Onshape app, I've opened up a document here, and you'll see at the bottom, I have a number of sheet metal tools. So sheet metal mod, uh, model, flange, tab, make joint, corner, uh, bend relief. So many of the same tools you'd see in the toolbar if you're in you know your browser. One question, though, that I think will come up is what about... Um, the flat view or the bend table or any of that information? And the answer is not yet. You can create the sheet metal parts, but you can't view the flat as of today in either mobile app, right? iOS or Android. Um, now, creating the sheet metal models, you know, relatively simple, very simple, uh, similar, of course, to uh, the browser experience. So I click sheet metal model. I define what type. Um, in this case, we're going to use convert. 
and convert the housing here. Uh, then define our faces to exclude. And so again, you know, this is for those new to Onshape Mobile. Um, again, I'm building this all from my iPad. I'm just selecting edges that are bins. So we'll spin this around here. And I'm using a lot of the precision selector to do that, right? Um, so precision selector is really just helpful in, in selecting those hard to select edges, right? Um, but then going through and defining K factor, thickness, all those types of things, um, you know, it is no different than, you know, uh, sheet metal in the browser, right? So I hit the check OK, and now I have my sheet metal part, again, created in on chain mobile right and that was not possible uh, in the past before this update so it is also something of course we're working on with with android as well right so we'll eventually have parity between the two um, and of course we'd also uh, like to see the flat pattern and the bin table in general uh, bring more consistency to the ui in terms of that you know fly out table element on the right um, but that definitely is a big one. I know that's one that's been requested a lot. You've been able to edit sheet metal parts on your mobile device for, you know, since sheet metal has launched, edit the features themselves. So I've been able to go in and edit the sheet metal model, but I've never been able to create a new sheet metal part from scratch on a mobile device. And, and now you can, right? All right. So that is the September 7th update uh, to OnShape. Now, as I mentioned before, we update roughly every three weeks. And so in September, we actually had two updates that went live, September 7th and September 28th. Drawing in iPad needed. Uh, yes, definitely use the feedback tool if you haven't already. Give us that feedback you know, formally to our support team. Um, but that's definitely something that has been requested before. The ability to create, not just view, but create drawings from a mobile device. All right, so September 28th, 2018, a number of big improvements, but at least in my opinion, the biggest improvement is not something that's new, it's not a checkbox option or a new feature or anything along those lines, it's a performance improvement. And the reason I highlight this is because the performance improvement in this case is, is pretty substantial and it's done in a rather unique way. And I always like to bring up things that are done in a unique way with regards to our architecture. So I'm gonna go over an example of, of this and, and show you a side-by-side -side before and after. Um, but the performance difference is noticeable. Um, the biggest thing I would stress is this is specific to drawing section views of very large assemblies. Right? So creating a section view of a large assembly in a drawing should be substantially faster than it was in the past. Um, now, what do I mean by large assembly? It's, it's somewhat difficult to define, but hundreds of thousands of parts is a good ballpark, a place to start. Now, I'd stress that this performance improvement is specific to designs across multiple part studios. What I mean by that is the performance improvement that's gained in this update, what it does is it splits up all of your part studios and then generates section views concurrently, right? The reason I mention this is if everything that you've done in your document is in a single part studio, you will not see a performance improvement, right? So the way this works again is it splits up part studios into multiple modeling engines, generates section views concurrently, and then brings them back together. Um, so that is an important thing to stress. It's another uh, benefit of splitting up your design into multiple part studios is you get that benefit of being able to split up the section view creation, right? So again, uh, important to stress, this w is only a benefit if you've if your design, your assembly comes from multiple different port studios. Now, you'll see the graphic there that I have. Um, it's just meant to illustrate that we're taking your assembly, you know, that may consist of hundreds or, or thousands of parts. Um, we're taking each of the part studios and splitting them into a different modeling engine, generating the section view, and then, you know, bringing them back together to, to make one. So that is very unique to Onshape's architecture. I always like to mention that because it means that you on a Chromebook, you know, that costs $250, can generate a section view of a thousand part assembly 
rather quickly because the horsepower, so to speak, to generate the actual cuts and, and generate the views uh, is done by us in the background, right? That is dramatically different than, you know, if you think of a SOLIDWORKS or Inventor or Creo or Katia where you have just that single CPU to work with, right? That single processor to work with, you're limited by what can be run through that processor at a single time where we're not in on-chain. Right, so we do generate drawing section views concurrently. Now, the really the best way I have to illustrate this is with a a before and after video, which I'm not a huge fan of showing videos in, in these, but forgive me. I think this is kind of the best way um, to illustrate my, my point. Um, so this is actually not a terribly complex assembly. This is a few hundred parts, right? Um, I will say, the bigger your assembly, the bigger performance gain you'll see from this, right? So this really scales well in that sense, right? Um, you know, because we can we can spin up many different modeling engines for all your different part studios that would have been done uh, in sequence in the past. All right, so bear with me for a moment. Let me maximize this and show you it. So I'm going to bring this back. The left side is on shape before, right? The right side is on shape after. As I mentioned before, not terribly complex, um, but a good example, right? A few hundred parts at least. And so if I hit play here, the section views are generated at the same moment. They're placed at the same moment. So the benefit here is really what happens after you click to place, and it needs to go through and generate all those section cuts. So if I hit play, we'll let this run, right? We'll, okay, so now both views have been placed. Right, so I left click to place the section view line. I move my section view out. I left click to place the view. So this is with a step where it goes through and generates all the section cuts in the background. And what you'll see is again, left side is before, right side is after. Notice how fast this view generates compared to this view. So if I hit play, that view is done. Right, so the view on the right is now done. We are at six seconds. Right. Um, now, again, I placed it at the four second point, so it took about two seconds, two to three seconds to generate. Now, this one, of course, is not done, but what I'll point out is just how big of a difference this is. If I hit play, six second point, 10 second point, 15 second point, 20 second point, right? So this video is about uh, 29 seconds. Right, so I think you'll get the idea, but it still hasn't. Right now, it is finished, so right around the 28-second point. So in this example, you can see substantial performance improvements. Still relatively simple. The bigger performance improvements will be felt by the bigger assemblies, where typically in the past, it had to do that in a linear fashion. Right now, they're all being generated concurrently. So uh, again, forgive me for the video format, but I think that's a good way of illustrating that was on shape in the past and on shape currently, and that should be uh, a, a substantial difference. Now, the question, uh, how is this being done? As I mentioned before, um, it, it's an architectural difference. So in on shape, we can generate multiple modeling engines and run them concurrently, architecturally. So we can we can you know spin them up and down, so to speak, as you need them, um, and it's it's a unique advantage. And, and many systems you're limited by the CPU or the actual you know type of CAD software that you're being that you're using, and this has lots of performance implications in other areas, right? So there's lots of potential here where we're using the key to this again is generating those multiple modeling engines and doing this concurrently. Right? All right. So I, again, not the typical presentation I do in that we don't show on shape itself, but I always like to mention performance improvements because I think it's something that uh, everyone always loves to see that was a substantial one as you saw in the, in the video um, in that example we shaved off 22 seconds you know what was 28 seconds became um, actually more than that right uh, considering the amount of time but um, yeah so again it's it's something that you shouldn't really see a difference in how it behaves it should just be much much faster and that's something that we aim for all right so the next improvements that I want to discuss 
are in standard content. And this is one that was highly requested by a number of users. We've had standard content, as I mentioned earlier, since the beginning of the year. Um, and if you're not familiar with standard content, it allows you to insert you know, your nuts, your bolts, your washer, your standard hardware um, without having to import from other libraries or build your own databases of these things. So in the insert dialog at the assembly level, you'll see this option for standard content. And in this example, I can go through and define, you know, what standard do I want? What type of hardware do I want? Um, you know, what size should it be? What length should it be? And so on. But once I've inserted, right, let's say that I wanted to insert, you know, bolts and all of these flanges. One problem that we've had in the past after something's been inserted is difficulty telling what's what, right? In the past, if you've used standard content, you'll know we didn't show, at least previously, the details of each piece of individual standard content in the instance list of the assembly, or more importantly, in the bill of materials, right? So this is a, a pretty big deal when we talk about, you know, showing uh, bolt numbers, because, you know, oftentimes the size of the bolt, the length of the bolt, uh, the details of the bolt you want showing here so that you can distinguish between them. Um, the reason this is important is you may have, have inserted the same bolt or, or whatever it may be, but different lengths or different sizes, just, just small changes. And you really couldn't tell the difference in the instance list or the bill of materials, right? Because it showed up just as bolt, right? It didn't give you the details of the bolt. So with this update, you'll see that has changed. You'll see the bolt type, but you'll also see size information that relates to just that bolt. So you can see this is an M16 by 2 by 45, right? Um, so it gives you the breakdown of the, the, the size, right, the length information, so that if I have, you know, many different bolts, same diameter, but different lengths, I'll be able to distinguish between them not just in the build materials, but also in the instance list of the assembly. So again, a small quality of life improvement, but for those doing a lot of standard content, working a lot with standard content, it really makes a big difference, the, the ability to see that hardware and what it is in the instance list, right? In the past, many users would actually go in and edit the standard content instance just to see you know, what it was. So that is the standard content improvements with this update. Uh, definitely one that was highly requested. Uh, the next one, additional drawing properties. Um, really, this is the the ability to define things in a little bit more detail. So in the past, we've had things like line thickness options and a few other settings that you can define um, at the drawing property level. Uh, but what we haven't had is the ability to define things like the detail view and the section view lines differently. Right, so you could set your line thickness, for instance, but it applied to all of those things uniformly. Right, so everything had the same line thickness, and what we had was the request of I want to be able to to you know place my section views with this line thickness and in this color. You know, sometimes it's requested that you know you may want section views in a certain color that's different from everything else. So what we've added in this update are additional properties that allow you to select things independently that in the past were kind of one global option. So bear with me for a moment. Let me go over where I think this is most useful. As I mentioned before, this is really applicable if you're trying to define differences in, in line thickness or color uh, to details like section view, right? Section view line thickness, I should say, or detail view line thickness. Um, also bin lines. If you're trying to adjust the, the thickness or the color of bin lines for your sheet metal parts, that's a that's an option you could set. All of these are available under drawing properties. So under the wrench icon on the right, you'll see additional properties here. Um, most notably, details like section view. Here's section view where I can set the hatch line thickness, right? The cutting line thickness. Uh, the arrowhead style, and these are specific to section view. So I can make section view uh, cutting lines thicker than detail view cutting lines or circle lines, or I can make them a different color, right? So again, in the past, these were very much a high level setting where now you have a lot more granular control over, you know, what exactly is, um, what it is that you're setting, right? 
again, this really stemmed from the request of the ability to, you know, define detail views or section views independently of one another, or bend lines and section view lines independently of one another. In the past, at the drawing level, that really wasn't uh, wasn't possible. All right, so those are the additional drawing properties. Again, you'll find all of them by clicking the drawing properties flyout, the little wrench icon on the right, and you'll fly out here. And you have the tabs for the various uh, property options that you have, and you'll see a number of different additional uh, properties that you can choose from. Again, all kind of stem from you know the ability to independently control these things as opposed to having one big option for all of them. All right, moving on. The next topic in the list, import into folder. And I think this is really useful if you've already created a document, you have this document structure with folders already established, and you want to import a part or an assembly or some file into an already existing folder within a document. Right? In the past, you could import it into the document and then move it into a folder, but it's never been really easy to just you know, move to folder or import it directly into a folder, right? There's always been that that additional step in the process. Um, so this is on one of those things that's really straightforward to show. So bear with me for a moment here. Um, I'm going to create a new folder, and we'll just call this, let's say, imported geometry. Right. So now I've created a new folder. If I go to the tab manager. On the left side, right? If I right click that folder, you'll see this option create and more importantly, import. That's the new option. Under create, you'll see import. And that allows me, of course, to go grab a file and bring that directly into this folder within this document. Right? Again, in the past, you could do this, but it had it meant moving things after it was imported. So just, a, again, a small quality of life thing. But again, if you've used a lot of folders in the document level, this is a big deal. Um, I know a lot of users that store all of their imported models in a folder inside of a document. And if you had to import new documents, new files into your document, it meant a two-step process, import and then move. So this gets rid of that. Again, just right-click the folder from the tab manager. You'll see create and then the option to import. All right, so that is import directly into a folder. The next improvement to discuss is thumbnails. So for DXF, DWG, and DWT files, you'll now have thumbnails displayed. Right? Now there's one very important caveat. You must first load that assembly. Right, that you want, or that, excuse me, that drawing. Right? So here's an example. This is a DXF that I've imported into a document. Right? And you can see as I mouse over the DXF tab, a thumbnail showing me the DXF appears. That didn't in the past. So DXF, DWG, or DWT, you did not see a thumbnail. Now one caveat is you do need to open that DXF once, meaning you need to load the tab, look at the drawing once, it will capture that thumbnail, and then from then on, when you mouse over the tab, you will see that thumbnail appear. Again, small quality of life improvement, but if you work a lot with DXFs, um, and, and more importantly, if you work a lot with DXFs and kind of have these arbitrary naming schemes where it could be difficult to find the right DXF within a document, this, is, this could be a big deal. Uh, because it means I can quickly look at the thumbnail without actually having to load the tab to figure out what it is, right? All right, so that is thumbnails, thumbnails for uh, DXF, DWG, and DWT, so the drawing format. The last one is another small quality of life improvement, but it emphasizes what I talked about earlier in terms of improved drag and grip behavior. So I mentioned earlier that we've added improved grip behavior so you get consistent feedback. So uh, uh, hollow circles indicate rotate, where solid circles indicate uh, drag, where squares indicate resize. So just meant as visual cues to let you know this is what's going to happen when you left click and drag this thing. And this has also been taken to tables. 
So bills of materials or just general tables, whatever it is, any kind of table at the drawing level, will also have this improved drag behavior. If you grab a corner of the table, you'll see that closed circle. And if you grab and drag, you can see you can drag the table around. If you want to resize the table, go to the midpoints of the table and you'll see the squares that I was talking about. And then you can drag and resize the table, right? Um, so let, let me get into an example of this just to show this because I didn't mention it earlier. So as I mentioned before, you have visual feedback. As I mouse over it, you'll see squares at the midpoints of the table and circles at the corners. And if I grab the circle in any of the corners, I can grab and move the table, right? Whereas if I grab the center squares, right, and drag, I can resize the table. Right. So again, just meant to be a bit more consistent. I know that seems like a small improvement, but for those doing a lot of work with tables in the past, getting them the right size and in the right position, you know, kind of meant this going back and forth between corner and center. And um, you know, it, this is definitely one of those. Um, that many people will, will love. So again, that, that drag behavior um, is consistent too. So you saw the, the closed circle, the squares indicating resize versus move. Um, you know, same goes for notes or for just about anything else. You'll see those grip points have been uh, made more consistent. Right? All right. So those are the topics that we had to cover for you here today. Um, one Last improvement that I would mention, uh, I'll just briefly mention here, um, is support for DIN hardware. Right? So this is another standard content improvement, but you'll see support for DIN hardware has been added with these recent updates. I should stress we added standard content in January of this year, and we're constantly adding new hardware to it. So with nearly every release since January, we've added new pieces of standard content. We're, that's not... There's no exception here where the next update is going to include uh, improvements you know, to it as well. So lots of um, you know, exciting stuff happening in terms of, of standard content. Lots of improvements lately to standard content. So that's what I had planned. I am going to stick around and answer any outstanding questions uh, that you have. So if you have any outstanding questions, please let me know. Um, one final comment that I have for you. If you're interested in learning more, definitely check out the Onshape Learning Center. If you're new to Onshape and you're interested in learning more about how we design our part studios or assemblies or any of the features of Onshape, definitely check out the Onshape Learning Center. And you'll find it at learn.onshape.com. Um, there's options for self-paced training. You could take training at your own pace or you can uh, be involved in something like instructor-led training. There's also technical briefings on a lot, you know, a lot of different topics. So, Definitely a valuable resource for learning on shape. So that is what I had planned. I want to say thank you, everyone, and have a good day.